Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The purpose of these presentations is to inform and educate the physicians, allied medical personnel, and the general public on the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine. I'm your host. My name is Von Merkrazier. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor CHI Medical Center. Our special guest today is Dr. Stephanie Coulter. Dr. Coulter is a director for Women's Heart and Vascular Health and program director, Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship and director of cardiology education and also Texas Heart Institute educational board member and special section editor here in Houston, Texas at Texas Heart Institute. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this program. Thank you. So happy to be here. You've done a great job providing all of us with all this educational content, which is good for our audience. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Well, the topic today of our presentation and discussion is an update on the diagnosis and treatment of abdominal aortic aneurysm in women. That's not a big subject matter, right? I mean, traditionally, we haven't looked for aneurysms in women too much. Absolutely. So, Dr. Coulter, the question is, what is, or what did Lucille Ball have in common with Albert Einstein, George C. Scott, and Conway Twitty, and many others? Well, I'm assuming, I know one of those people died of an aneurysm, so I'm assuming we're talking about ruptured aneurysms. That is absolutely correct. So it affects all races, all ages, and it doesn't discriminate mm -mm. anything. So what is the epidemiology of an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Because they're different than from ascending aortic aneurysm. So abdominal aortic aneurysms are common over the age of 50, years of age, uh, with a prevalence of 1.4%. Abdominal aortic aneurysms are more often uh, detected incidentally on some routine evaluation for other conditions, typically for gastrointestinal complaints mm -hmm. or musculoskeletal complaints, uh, and uh, very frequently they go underdiagnosed or mm. undiagnosed for a long period of time. The majority of abdominal aortic aneurysms are asymptomatic until they rupture, so we call them a silent killer. Yeah. Risk factors for abdominal aortic aneurysm include older age, particularly in males, mm -hmm. Caucasian race, history of smoking, history of arterial hypertension, and particularly history of abdominal aortic aneurysm, and particularly history of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Are there gender differences for abdominal aortic aneurysm? They are, mm -hmm. and that is a very important factor to take into consideration. Male gender is well-established risk factor for abdominal aortic aneurysm, and the ratio is somewhere between four to one, and in some reports, even seven to one. I think that's why we underestimate women having these because we don't expect it to occur in women because it's such a male-dominated condition. Right. This is absolutely correct. There is understanding that women, uh, because of the hormonal differences, are protected against atherosclerosis mm -hmm. to menopause. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's very rare to diagnose uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm in women before the menopause. Right. But after that, there are they catch up. They catch up, yeah. as in anything else, mm -hmm. uh, as far as atherosclerosis is concerned. So if it's a silent killer, screening must be really important in those people that we think are at risk. Well, this has been a debatable issue for a very long period of time, particularly as far as women are concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, as you can see from this information on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, mm -hmm. as far as screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm in women is concerned, it's not rated as a very high probability of uh, success in doing evaluation in women. And uh, while in, in men it's more meaningful and more important, in women it has been established to be less beneficial. However, some other um, data is available, particularly from the SVS screening guidelines, that um, emphasize uh, that screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm in women should be done. And the question is when. Mm -hmm. 
So we nowadays uh, agree that probably women that are above the age of 65 with family history of abdominal aortic aneurysm should definitely be screened and evaluated for abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that evidence is between moderate to strong. Is there a difference in the expansion rate and rupture in women compared to men? Yeah, that's another very important issue that has been more recently analyzed. And what we can see here from this particular information as far as uh, initial abdominal aortic aneurysm size and then increase in size over a period of uh, years or follow-up, we can see that aneurysms grow wow. much faster in women than in men. That's a scary looking curve. It's absolutely scary from the point of view that if the aneurysm goes under or undiagnosed in women, then we certainly can miss the opportunity wow. to prevent rupture. And another important factor is, as we can see here from some other publications, the f females experience rupture at smaller aneurysm sizes than men. Wow. Now this is understandable because uh, female aortas are smaller in diameter. Right. So we cannot use the same criteria as far as uh, the risk of rupture is concerned as in men. And this has been documented in several studies. In this particular study, as far as uh, aneurysm rupture is concerned, we can see, again, that aneurysm rupture in women at the smaller sizes and the risk of rupture at the same size might be for men 5% and in women 24%, which is statistically wow. significant. So women have smaller abdominal aortic aneurysm diameters and higher rate of rupture even at smaller aneurysm sizes. So what are the challenges for the correction by endovascular techniques of aneurysms in women? Because the arteries are smaller, so. So obviously we have several challenges and we will mention some of them. One of them could be um, the access size vessels right. because the vessels are significantly smaller, particularly with uh, earlier generation stem grafts they were significantly larger in profile, and that was a serious challenge. Then the second thing is women, as we will see, have a significantly higher incidence of tortuosity, mm -hmm. higher incidence of calcification, higher incidence of thrombus, and higher incidence of uh, challenges with the infrarenal aortic neck as far as diameter is concerned, as far as uh, uh, irregularities, presence of thrombus, and presence of calcification is concerned. In this particular graph, as we can see from this particular publication related to um, the, whether the patients are candidates or not candidates for EVAR, that significantly larger proportion of men are candidates for EVAR. And this is a little bit outdated, but at this point of time when this study was published, 65% of males were candidates for EVAR while only 35% of women were candidates for EVAR with current technologies. And as we mentioned before, and he can, we can see he, here clearly, as far as some of the challenges with EVAR in women is concerned, they have more frequently narrowed vessels, occluded vessels, tortuosities, calcifications, and aneurysmal dilatations. There are several studies that uh, looked into this particular issue. And on an average, from M2S database on over 43,000 CTs, roughly 40% of patients have less than six millimeter uh, access vessel diameters. Mm. Now in women, this number is significantly greater and 55% of female population that have been evaluated for EVAR have access vessels of less than six millimeters. As far as infrarenal neck is concerned, again, we have certain issues, as we mentioned, that makes it difficult to perform EVAR, such as short necks, which are less than 15 millimeters in length, reverse tapered necks, calcium, presence of thrombus, severe angulation, and large diameter. And again, from um, M2S database, 
48% of patients that have been looked into have necks of less than 15 millimeters in diameter and therefore in length, and therefore they're not candidates for EVAR. Now for women, this number again mm -hmm. is significantly larger. And 63% of women have neck lengths less than 15 millimeters. So a significantly larger number of patients have challenging infrarenal neck anatomy in women than in men. This means that women have to go for open procedures because they are not as many candidates for a stent graft. Or the surgery or endovascular treatment was not recommended for that particular so reason. So they just were treated with medical therapy. Medical therapy. And this is where the rupture rates are yeah. higher. So in another publication, as we can see here uh, from Lancet, we can see that um, 30 4% of patients were, in this particular study, uh, eligible for EVAR, while 54% of males were candidates for EVAR. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we can see here, which is another interesting um, point, is that more women declined intervention than men. And, uh, so these were women that were offered the procedure, that is but correct. then they decided against it. They decided against it. Again, it is not clearly known why, but it's a fact that we have to take it's, into consideration. That's a fact in all trials of intervention. Which Women is interesting. Are in, more likely to not pursue the recommended therapy. They're older. They just choose not to do it and to take the conservative route. Yeah, this is true because in general, women that develop uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm are what we call typical vasculopaths. Yes. They will have peripheral arterial disease, they will have renovascular disease, mm -hmm. they will have coronary artery disease, and frequently they have diabetes, mm -hmm. and they're smokers. So when we present the information to them, I think it's appropriate and we do that, we mention that they are at higher risk for mm -hmm. any kind of procedure. And I think this was one of the factors that some of them declined yeah, those procedures. Now, also, as we can see here from this particular publication, a significantly larger number of women uh, have a higher 30-day mortality. And again, this is due to comorbid conditions. Yeah. Almost double. Right. So what are the new developments for treatment of AAA in women? Well, we have uh, exciting things happening as far as EVAR is concerned or endovascular repair of abdominal aortic aneurysm in women is concerned. Uh, I looked at this uh, several decades ago, and uh, <clears throat> what we found is that because of the challenges of access and challenges in anatomy, we truly didn't have uh, appropriate stem grafts mm -hmm. for use in women. And we needed uh, devices that would be more suitable to a female, a female anatomy mm -hmm. and pathology. And within the last uh, decade or so, uh, the devices are becoming smaller, mm -hmm. they are becoming more flexible, and uh, more what I would call user-friendly for uh, deploying the stem graft and also offering good long-term outcomes. One of them is uh, this uh, Ovation stem graft that uh, has uh, very innovative uh, uh, aspects from the point of view that it's um, uh, very low in profile, mm -hmm. significantly lower than the other devices. This device is uh, 12 French in profile as far as ID and a maximum 14 French OD. While the great majority, almost all of the other competitor devices are 16 or 18 French in profile, which is a big, big, big issue in challenging anatomy and small mm -hmm. access vessels. So this device is well suited for narrowing of the arteries, severe calcification, and tortuosities, as well as challenges of the infrarenal neck. And um, one of the studies that we were involved in as a co-principal investigator was so-called life registry. And life registry uh, was uh, the first study that looked into percutaneous approach, local anesthesia, uh, no ICU admission, and next day discharge mm. using this low-profile ovation stem graft. 
And as far as percutaneous approach, a successful femoral artery access repair, it was achieved in 97% of patients, which is higher than in any other previous publication. In addition to that, this particular study showed the lowest incidence of major adverse events, which was 0.4% really? at, at, at uh, 30 days. In addition to that, we had a very short procedure, significantly shorter than in other published studies, as well as shorter hospital stay, 1.1 days, and a no ICU stay. And we were able to achieve that because we had innovative technology with low profile device. So you've made the hospital happy because you got the patients out quicker and you made the patients happy because you were able to provide a service to people that ordinarily wouldn't be offered that service right. with low side effects. So this was an important step, this particular study, to uh, look into the benefits of using this type of technologies in women mm -hmm. that undergo EVAR. And you can use it in men as well. In men as well, yeah. right. So this study was uh, published in Journal of Endovascular Therapy a year ago. So what about the LUCY trial? So the LUCY trial was very exciting trial from the point of view this, that this was the first ever trial in women that underwent EVAR mm -hmm. with a low profile device. And uh, the study uh, actually was named uh, on the basis of evaluation of females who are underrepresented candidates for abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. And the LUCY study was initiated to explore the clinical benefits associated with EVAR using the low profile ovation prime system in female population. The ratio between men and uh, women were two to one, two men to one female ratio. And again, we wanted to make sure that in this particular study, we had a control group Mm -hmm. to determine if there are any unexpected risks that were, would be encountered in the female population. There were 75 females in the treated arm and 150 males in control arm. And this study was carried on in 45 uh, sites in the United States. So it means uh, across the board mm -hmm. representing uh, most of the centers, mm -hmm. leading centers that are performing EVAR. So what were the results of this Lucy study? The results were impressive, I would have to say. And here we can see, as far as procedural outcomes are concerned, the deployment success or ability to deploy the device in desired location was 100% in women and 99% in, in a, a male population. And again, this was not statistically significant, but uh, pretty much everybody got the <laughs> everybody the got a yeah. device, right? And there was also very high uh, um, use of so-called percutaneous approach, bilateral percutaneous mm -hmm. approach, as high in women as in men, which again uh, gives a tribute to the low-profile mm -hmm. device that's designed and dedicated for percutaneous use. Mm. Now, also, as we can see, there was no difference in procedure time, even mm -hmm. though uh, women had a more challenging anatomy. Mm -hmm. But it means that this device offered um, us the opportunity to do this procedure in a very efficient way. And the device time was evenly distributed. The blood loss was similar in both groups. And the use of adjunctive procedures was uh, similar mm -hmm. in both groups. Now, what's also very important is when we look at the freedom from device-related secondary interventions, there was no difference between males and females. That's Basically, really impressive. So endo-leaks were the same. 97% success rate. Not only type 1 endo-leak, but also type 3 endo-leak, or instance of occlusion of the iliac arteries, mm -hmm. there were basically no significant differences between males and females, which is the first time that mm -hmm. we have ever seen this type of finding. So can you summarize what we've learned and what are the latest results of the evaluation and treatment of AAAs in women since 
That's what we're talking about today. Right. Well, we have to realize that women are underrepresented as far as EWAR is concerned in clinical trials until present time, despite a distinct need to identify appropriate gender-specific treatment mm -hmm. algorithms, which is of great uh, interest and concern at the present time. Current screening procedures for abdominal aneurysm should be expanded to include uh, and be more focused in an effort to identify affected females. So in the past, the guidelines for screening aneurysms were for a male with a history of hypertension or smoking or a family history to undergo routine screening. But I'm not sure that the recommendations before now have included the screening of women for silent aneurysms. So in our practice, who should we, should we be screening women with a family history those with hypertension and those who smoke after age 65 routinely by ultrasound? Is that what we're recommending now? Uh, I think that uh, we should be screening males and females above the age of 65 on a routine basis. Right. And you know, you're an expert in the ultrasound and uh, it's a very inexpensive and very reliable it's tool. It's easy to do. Easy to do. It's being done, but maybe not enough. I think w churches and many other. It's uh, not part of life screen. I exactly. Mean, it, well, it may be part of some maybe life screening. Maybe it should be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think from that point of view, definitely patients, whether they are men or women, that have hypertension, history of smoking, right, above the age of sixty-five, and definitely those individuals that have a family history right. of dominatic aneurysm or other risk factors such right. as diabetes and so on. Right. So uh, uh, females experience rupture at smaller aneurysm sizes than men and uh, fewer women were in the past eligible for EVAR but that is no longer the case Most on excellent. the basis of the LUCID trial. So I think we have gained very valuable uh, information that we can use for a future treatment of a female population with abdominal aortic aneurysm. Most excellent. We have plenty of room to move on this, move the needle on this. I actually have patients that come in and with family histories that are worried and ask for screening. And I think that getting the message out that we should be more eagerly screening women that are at increased risk. But certainly I'd put the plug in for prevention works too. So all the work that we're doing as doctors now for controlling blood pressure and counseling patients not to smoke or hopefully improving our later consequences for the development of aneurysms because uh, certainly they are partially preventable in those patients that have the risk factors that, that lead to it. I absolutely agree. I would like to congratulate you on your efforts through your uh, women's program that you have here at Texas Heart Institute in uh, public awareness on not just related to the aneurysms, right. but atherosclerotic disease and many other conditions that are of great concern to all of us. Uh, as far as the future is concerned, I see that uh, the screening will be a routine thing. Uh, I also see that there will be newer technologies available. We will be probably uh, more involved in preventive type of a care. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is enough of information now available that there are certain trials ongoing, at least first in men, that has been done where we can see that we can shrink aneurysms by um, uh, using chemicals of different kind, injecting them into the aortic wall, not only for atherosclerotic aneurysms but also for uh, connective tissue disease so the to uh, stabilize the uh, elastin yeah. and stabilize the collagen. So uh, makes it stronger. Right, right. So That's preliminary weird. data is very, very encouraging. The information is already available from cadaver testing mm -hmm. and also from the animal studies and uh, first in man uh, study has been already done wow, in that's, this particular. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So maybe the stem grafts are not going to be the future, right. but a medical treatment in stabilizing the aortic wall and preventing the aneurysm increase. 
right. over a period of time. Most excellent. Thank you very much no, for participating for in this program, and I'm looking forward to work with you on many other programs well, in the future. Thank you for your attention to these important discussions that we're having here at Texas Heart Institute. We're trying to get the message out.